Anyways, thank you for introducing me. My name is Tiffany Galloway. I'm the product manager of the Nitro Stabilizer business in the United States for Dyer Sciences. Um, we're based out of Indianapolis, Indiana. So a couple things I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of nitrogen stabilization. Uh, we're going to feature or talk about first the importance of nitrogen and ammonium nitrogen. Uh, and then I'm going to get through exactly what our products do and why it is important to make sure that we're stabilizing that nitrogen. So ammonium nutrition. So the plant can uptake both ammonium and nitrate forms. Uh, what scientists have proven is that in the early stages of corn growth production, it is important that they have an abundance of ammonium nutrition. Now, yes, do they, can they still utilize nitrate? Of course, of course they can. But nitrate is then also susceptible to leaching, denitrification, some of these other things, which I'm going to touch on here in a little bit. So we want to make sure that we are keeping it in the ammonia form for longer so that the plant can utilize that ammonia form of nitrogen. So the ion mobility. So we know that opposites attract sometimes. Uh, the soil is, for the most part, negatively charged. Ammonium is positively charged, so they make a happy marriage. Now, when we get to nitrate, nitrogen, that's when we start seeing that conversion. We're, we're taking two negatives, we're putting them together, and that's where, again, we start seeing some of this leaching, some of this denitrification, a lot of issues that uh, have definitely been top of mind for a lot of people these days when it comes to environmental impacts of nitrates. Uh, especially in the groundwater. So we want to make sure, again, that we are stabilizing that nitrogen and where we are prolonging it in that ammonia form for longer because, again, it has a happy marriage, a happy binding with the soil, and we want to keep it that way so that it stays in place. So the proper amount of nitrogen, it is important because if we have not proper amount of nitrogen, I'll show some pictures here in a little bit, uh, we see disease pressure increasing. We see um, we're not... A, we're not able to maximize the potential of that crop. So we're not going to be able to achieve the maximum yield for most of our crops if we are having a nitrogen deficiency. In addition, an excess nitrogen can cause stock lodging, can cause disease incidences, can also cause nitrate leaching. And again, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we are keeping these nitrates out of the groundwater as much as possible. So we want to make sure, again, that we're stabilizing that nitrogen. So here's some pictures of some nitrogen deficiency. We call it uh, firing. Uh, I sold the seed for a little bit uh, in my prior tenure to this position. So saw some of this, definitely. Uh, we see a lot more of it as we have these wetter springs, which I'll touch on here in a little bit. Uh, a lot of farmers are in the fields right now trying to get their crops planted, and obviously, April showers are going to bring hopefully May flowers, and we're going to have a lot of rain in April probably, and we're going to see a lot of this if we're not stabilizing our nitrogen. And again, nitrogen management today, it is something that is top of mind in Iowa, in Minnesota, everywhere you go, Chesapeake Bay, Lake Erie, you name it. It is something that is very important to the government, to a lot of legislators right now. It's important to these states, it's important to these watersheds. And we want to continue to provide a solution or have a tool in the toolbox as a solution instead of just having issues. So that's what our product does. We provide a tool in the toolbox to a problem or an opportunity that's going on right now. So the nitrogen cycle, we apply our nitrogen and then we have this conversion. Well, why does that conversion or what happens when that conversion occurs from ammonium to nitrite to eventually nitrate? is these little bacteria called nitrosomonas bacteria. What they do is they convert that ammonium to that nitrate, and then the nitrobacter come in and convert it eventually to nitrate nitrogen. So what does our product do? We put the nitrosomonas bacteria in a, what we call stasis, or a drunken stupor. We put them to sleep. You pick your favorite analogy, and that's what we do to it. Because those are the ones those little bacteria, anaerobic bacteria, are the ones that are making that conversion happen. And when the temperature gets warmer, that's when they colonize and they expand more, which I'll touch on here shortly. So the primary nitrogen losses that occur are volatilization, occurs on the surface, and then we got denitrification, eventually leading to leaching. Um, so nitrification, that's where 70%, if loss is going to occur, will occur below ground. The rest of it will occur above ground and it'll volatilize. So again, there's a lot of things that affect that. pH, 
compaction, so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, what we see is that if 70% of loss is going to occur, it's going to occur below ground. And that has been scientifically proven. So nitrification is temperature sensitive. So these nitrous amounts of bacteria, they get put to sleep as our soil temperatures are typically below that 45 to 50 degree mark. As we start getting warmer, uh, as we get into these spring seasons, as we get in, obviously, the summer, we're going to see that uptake happen. So they, they are colonizing, they are reproducing, and they are converting, again, that ammonium nitrogen. So we want to make sure that we're stopping them from doing that. So we do have, so I'm going to show a lot of, well, not a lot, but if anybody is looking for data points, we have 40 years. We've been, we've been selling this product for over 40 years. I have a ton, ton, ton of trial work if you're interested. We have anything from manure. This is featuring in hybrid ammonia. We also have your and UAN studies as well. But at the end of the day, we're taking a look at what happens to nitrification with and without the nitrogen stabilizer. And you'll see this is based out of the University of Illinois. Um, you're seeing that the percent of ammonia that's still in the form, or that's still in, available in the soil um, when we are using NSERF, which is nitrogen stabilizer, is much higher than no inhibitor whatsoever. So here's the gross uh, curve for corn, or the nitrogen uptake corn curve uh, for corn. Um, and the blue bars, that's a stabilized. So again, that's using instinct or NSERF. And then the red is without a nitrification inhibitor. So at the end of the day, when the crop is needing to utilize as much nitrogen as possible, if you're not using an inhibitor, it could potentially not be there for when it needs it the most. Other factors affecting the nitrification, obviously at the end of the day, like I said, it's going to be wet this spring more than likely. So we're going to see ponding such as this in a lot of fields. And when this happens, where is that nitrogen going? So at the end of the day, uh, most yield reductions, farmers care about yield, obviously. Most yield reductions come in two forms. Again, denitrification and leaching. 10% loss occurs in the first three days when you have saturated soils. And then each additional day after that, uh, you can incur another 10% on top of that. And leaching, again, heavy soils as an issue, um, and then sandy soils as well. Sandy soils, we see a lot more in that volatilization area, which we do understand. Um, but at the end of the day, we're definitely targeting some of the sandy soils as well. So again, instinct and insert, they're stopping that nitrous ammonia bacteria from converting that ammonium nitrogen to eventually nitrate nitrogen. We're the only proven nitrification inhibitor on the market. So we're EPA registered. We've been proven scientifically for 30, for, sorry, over 40 years. Um, we are part of the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy, the Minnesota Best Management Practices. We are part of the 4R program. Um, and again, at the end of the day, we are providing a tool in the toolbox for an opportunity that's facing a lot of farmers these days. And we have proven science, proven technology to support the fact that we are an nitrification inhibitor. Um, there was a meta-analysis done. Um, Dr. Wolf did a meta-analysis. You can look it up online. I have the information if you need to. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we have saw 16% decrease in nitrogen bleaching. We have a 51% decrease in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and soil retention is very high as well. I think I got that here. Yes, soil retention is 28%, and that 48% is actually 51. I apologize for that. So we're also seeing, in addition to not only the environmental benefits of this product as well, but a 7% advantage when we use fall apply versus untreated, and a 5% yield advantage versus untreated in the spring. So not only are we providing environmental benefits as well, we're also providing yield benefits as well. In addition to giving growers that opportunity to better understand how much nitrogen they actually need to be applying, because a lot of guys are over applying. And we provide that opportunity for them to cut back on their rates a little bit and to still maximize the nitrogen as much as possible. What questions do we have? Really? Have you used it with manure?
Uh, we have many. So uh, Dr. Josh McGrath used it in poultry litter out on the East Coast. Uh, we have extensive manure studies at the University of Minnesota. Um, we have studies from Purdue, Iowa. We have used it a lot, a lot of manure. We actually see our biggest bang for our buck in manure. Yes, that's where our highest yields come out of, is manure as well. So if you're using it in manure, at what point in the, I guess, the manure handling process is it applied to the manure? Great question. Um, question was, what process, when you're applying manure, when is it added? Um, you can either add it when it's in the pit. So if it's an outside manure pit, it can be added as long as you understand how many acres you're trying to treat. So we're a per acre rate. So you determine how many acres you're intending to treat, and then you pour our product in, essentially, into a little lagoon. We also have the ability to be injected into the drag line system, and we also have the ability to be injected when we're taking it from the pit to the honey wagon as well. So it can be added. We have two pieces of equipment that allow for that, and we also allow the ability for you to pour it directly into the outside pit. We don't do anything in the enclosed, in any confined pit system. Anything? Go ahead. So if you increase the rate beyond the recommended rate, will it? Like for the time that it protects the nitrogen. So do we get additional residual control when we add more? No, I think we have not proven that. No. Do we have negative effects on any soil bacteria or anything like that if you would increase the rate? No. Not until you get to about 7x or would we see any sort of adverse effects, which I've never heard anybody do that yet. So, but yes. Rough cost, still $10, $12 an acre, roughly. Roughly, 17 yeah. ounces. Yep. Yeah. No, um, 37 ounces. 37. So we're 37 in the north, we're 37 to 74, is where our label states. Um, so yeah. you're still recommending 74 in the fall? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? Actually, no fun. Um, yeah. So beyond the, uh, the nitrifying bacteria, what other bacteria have? have Like what effects on the other bacterial populations? So we do not do anything else on any any other bacteria in the soil. We have no adverse effects on any beneficial bacteria in the soil. We strictly our DNA and the nitropyrin is made up to specifically target the nitrosomonas bacteria. Um, so that's that's all I know. That's all I proven you to. Anything else? All right, let's give her a hand.